If I was going to add more fancy bells and whistles, you know, I might consider putting a moon. There is a wave thing going on here, so you could definitely kind of put a moon up above. You could try to figure out stars. Lots of little design tricks that you could put in the sky, including uh, clouds. And so for clouds, I might be tempted to use, clean the, the rod on a, on a piece of cotton, but I might be tempted to use, so here, look, I am going ahead and adding fancier bells and whistles. Might be tempted to add a little dot of this aquamarine, this light aquamarine. And I'm doing two dots next to each other, and maybe three, sort of to create a cloud-like pattern. But the dotting is done below the flame, if you see what I'm doing. Or it's in the flame, but the bead is held below the flame. So your feed rod has to be in the flame, but the canvas itself, the bead, does not need to be. Now melt those clouds in. You could get more nuanced if you wanted. You could add a little deeper blue to highlight some of the color of the cloud. You can figure out how to put silver color in, or even white. You can get very painterly as well with glass bead making. And there are bead makers for whom that is what they do. They basically paint canvases on these small miniature um, surfaces. Very lovely, very special. And there's also people, the subject of their canvases is botanical or floral. There's people who just do that. I tend to be more geometric and um, liking curves and curve, abstract curve patterns. So this wave bead would be sort of in that category but really pretty. I'm melting it in now, melting everything in. I'm kind of wanting to get the bead not to be so lumpy. And I find that by melting and then hanging out with it, sort of watching and turning, you can introduce a lot of regularity and symmetry to the bead. Let nature, let heat do what it's going to do. In terms of helping me get an even bead. And I find using tools is often a great way to make it more distorted and misshapen. So there's a whole line of thought in bead making that the fewer tooling, the less tool, less tool moves you make, the better. Jim Smirsich is an advocate of that position. And a lot of his instruction in bead work is based on just doing gra letting gravity and um, physics of the glass do their thing with minimal marvering. And there's others who power through their beads and add a lot of uh, shape and form by virtue of using marvers. So we have a real interesting kind of shape happening where I've been bringing the barrel bead shape almost to a little bit of a cone at the top. And if it were mounted in the vertical like that, that would be a really pretty um, a pretty effect, a pretty shape. So let's let's go with that. Let's let's make our kind of semi cone, and you do that by sort of beveling at an angle, and do this in multiple passes. Rome wasn't built in a night, and beads aren't either. Just sort of go and look at it and see how it is until you're sort of satisfied with what you've got. Remember, of course to always um, heat up the bead after it's been touched to a cold tool. You want to re remove the chill marks that the cold tool introduced, and also not just the visible marks, but the internal stress that chilling one area down at the expense of another had on uh, the bead. You don't want the bead to fracture later. And I should mention that no amount of proper annealing will relieve certain kinds of stress that have been introduced 
by chilling the bead too much in one area and not enough in the other, not having it equalized, not having the uh, homogenizing heat applied properly. All of that's important, and annealing in a kiln will not fix some of these deeper um, structural uh, inequalities that might have been introduced. So it's really important to always heat up after touching a cold tool, and it's also important when you're done with your detail work to go in and give yourself a nice kind of gentle fluffy heating of the bead. And I wouldn't exactly call this a flame anneal, I'd call this more sort of a pre-flame anneal homogenizing low glow heating. And that will definitely equalize the zones of heat in the bead and really make, make it so the bead's going to last almost forever. Putting a nice rounded bottom on this bead by virtue of um, simply using the flame the heat of the flame. I've got a nice pucker going on the bottom too. Pucker is that quality where the hole of the bead, there's an indentation leading to that hole, and pucker is good. It's pleasing to the finger and to the eye. If this bead were mounted laterally on a cord, if it had a good pucker, um, you, the cord doesn't get frayed or cut into as easily. So pucker is really a good quality for all beads. And this one's going to have pot pucker on the bottom and then I can work, once the bottom sets up, I can work and draw and round out the, the top as well. So I have made a decision on this bead that it will be mounted in the vertical. And using gravity to get pucker, I let the, um, the hot glass on that bottom sort of drop down. You can true the edge a little bit. And periodically flash the done part, the, the bottom in this case. But because the bottom is relatively rigid and firm, heating up the top and holding in the down, downward position, this is uh, not going to distort the bead very much because the bottom is still anchoring it. And now I use a little steak knife just to gently prod that top to be sort of in a uniform line. And remember, after using a cold tool, just flash it in the flame a little bit. And now I do an overall heating. gentle, not to lose my form that I've worked hard on. You can see the clouds. You could put little stick figure people in. There's really no limit to what, what can be done. So that's a wave bead, a landscape style wave bead. Boat not included kind of reminds me of those Japanese woodcuts from the 16th or 17th century. Do a flame anneal with a nice bushy flame once. Get, be sure to get the ends. Let the heat soak in. Pull it out of the flame twice. Hold it still, and one last time, and then wait about seven seconds on our trip to the kiln. The kiln is preheated, and it is a thousand degrees, so I'm going to tune it down to about 940, and into the kiln I go. Making sure when you put the bead into the kiln not to put it on top of another bead, because it's possible that your most recently completed bead is still slightly tacky. And remember never to put it on the top chamber of a bead kiln where the electrodes are, but rather into the, the chamber made for the um, beads, which has a protective shield between the two layers so that you cannot electrocute yourself. I totally do not recommend using a ceramic kiln 
for firing pottery for bead making for that exact reason, because um, ceramic kilns have exposed elements and that introduces a risk of electrocution and shock that you need not be exposed to.